Good morning, everyone. Um, a short announcement. We will start briefly. We're waiting for one more panelist, and then we'll uh, move on with the panel. Thank you. Okay, so hello again. My name is Patrick Pavlak. I work for the E Institute for Security Studies uh, here in Paris, but I'm also a co-chair of the advisory board of the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise. Uh, and I'm very happy to have with me several members of the advisory board, but also uh, people who are members of the GFC themselves. And uh, the focus of this session is on uh, public-private uh, civic partnerships, which is something that we've decided to bring to this conversation for two, simpler, two simple reasons. One, for an explicit recognition that the civil society has a role to play in cyber capacity building, the fact that we think is very often omitted by the governments and private actors still. Uh, but secondly, to also recognize the fact that civil society organizations themselves are increasingly involved in the implementation of the capacity building projects. Uh, something that, uh, again, doesn't get uh, enough recognition in my view. Uh, and to discuss this question with me, I have six excellent panelists. Uh, for the sake of time, we only have one hour. We're going to uh, keep it short and sweet and hopefully engage in a conversation with you afterwards. Uh, please join the conversation with questions, comments, or also feel free to share your own experiences uh, in the field of capacity building if your organization or yourselves are involved in any of these type of activities. Uh, we are only six uh, on this side. There are many more of you in the room and I hope that uh, we're going to have a good conversation afterwards. So to kick us off, I will start with a few very general questions uh, where I hope our panels will be able to contribute and then we'll open it for, uh, for the conversation. I'll start with a question to Manon, Catherine, and Enrico, who I know have been involved in uh, different projects on the side of the GFC Secretariat, but also as the research institutes and um, civil society organizations, with a question on this broad triangular relationship. Um, how does it work in practice, in your view? I mean, I have, I have started with a very uh, simple assumption that it's not working really well still, that we only see primary focus on two aspects of, uh, of this relationship. Where does the civil society fill in with your view? To what roles do they play? Uh, what drives them? Uh, how can we create better incentives to, uh, to build those partnerships? And do we need them at all, actually? Maybe we, maybe we think that what we talk about most of the time, public-private partnership or the broadly defined cooperation is something that, that's enough. Uh, so why don't we start with you, Manon, who has a very good overview from the side of the GFC Secretariat with many initiatives going on, working groups, and um, how many members now? It's over 60 members, I think. 71. So please go ahead. Thank you. Um, so the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise is a platform which encourages international cooperation on cyber capacity building. Uh, and it's built on the multi-stakeholder model. So with the launch in 2015, the focus was on members as well as partners. So members being countries, international organizations, and private companies, uh, as well as partners, which include civil society. Uh, but I think already at the beginning of the GFCE, there was a call for more involvement of the civil society, which led to the installation of the advisory board. Uh, I believe that it's dependent on the content to see what are the appropriate stakeholders to join the table. Uh, at the beginning, the working structure of the GFCE focused on initiatives, which was actually 
focus more on members with the slight involvement of some partners. I think with the uh, creation of the Delhi Communique, which was endorsed by the uh, entire GFC community, both members, partners, as well as the advisory board, which created a common focus uh, in cyber capacity building, that we created uh, the working groups, which provides more room for the inclusion of all stakeholders, uh, as well as civil society. So it's actually the movement that the GFC has made from awareness to implementation uh, creates more room to have more stakeholders at the table. Great, and if I can ask a quick follow-up question. Uh, as of last year, I think the GFC has also moved in the direction of having partner organizations involved in the process. And I think that might be of interest for many people in the room who actually would think of becoming a partner. So what do the partners do? What is their role? How can they potentially, uh, how people in the room could get involved and uh, contact the secretariat? What would be the concrete steps to, to do that? Yes, so the GFC, uh, now we're moving towards implementation, we really need the partners because that's where the expertise is. Both in implementing partners as academia, as civil society, we need you in the implementation process of cyber capacity building. So we're trying to do this by creating a cyber capacity building knowledge portal, which is, uh, we have now a small advisory group with different knowledge institutions who are trying to set up this portal. Uh, but to have the content that we need for the implementation on the portal, we need uh, partners. So if you're interested to become uh, connected with the GFC community, please send an email to the GFC secretariat or talk to one of our advisory board members uh, or talk to me after the session. <laughs> and can I have a quick show of hands? How many of you have heard about the GFCE before, Global Forum on Cyber Expertise, so that I also know What's the level of awareness in the room? Okay, one, that, that, okay, not, not that many. Uh, so I think we may also want to uh, incorporate some elements uh, about what the GFC actually does and, uh, and how we are involved in, uh, in the whole process. Um, Katrin, would you like to continue? Let me see. Um, uh, after having Man, um, Manon explaining the uh, structure and the dynamics in GFC, I think it's important to go back to the uh, question of um, at least um, three pillars. Their public-private partnerships um, will eventually uh, succeed as long as, uh, obviously, the governance structure of these ones are clear and transparent uh, to the members. And so uh, in my current research on uh, PPPs uh, to counter cybercrime, I, um, and I mentioned this in a prior workshop, I have uh, encountered as main challenge that um, such a governance structure sometimes uh, is not clear or transparent. And so I think if we tackle this specific uh, aspect that can create uh, more trust uh, on, on PPPs, I think we can attract uh, and also create incentives, as you mentioned, Patrick, uh, on, uh, on uh, um, basically going for, for, for partnerships. Cyber crimes, of course, makes a, a very um, sensitive case for PPPs. And I think uh, if we look at the regulatory framework for PPPs, that is within the, uh, convention, the, the Budapest Convention, um, very much relies in, regu in, regulatory, uh, in a regulatory approach. And so there are specific articles, for instance, in the Budapest Convention, 16 to 21 specifically, that uh, speaks about this need for um, a, a, a legal basis for, for, uh, for partnerships. Um, so I, I will start with that uh, note of, of uh, uh, seeking for uh, clarity and transparency of, of the goals of this in order to create incentives for, uh, for um, these partnerships to come up. Um, the private sector specifically has been very, um, um, in a way, there has been some initiatives, and I'm also looking in, my, in the course of my research to obviously use cases and good practices, such as the GFC. Um, to add to that, I will say uh, the World Economic Forum has uh, come across with some specific principles or guidelines uh, uh, for private-public uh, partnerships in the field of cybercrime or to counter cybercrimes. Um, 
And obviously, uh, it's also worth to mention uh, uh, the Digital Geneva Convention uh, that is being discussed still and, and undergoing discussions. Um, so that's for um, just for preliminary thoughts on, on, on your question. A, a quick follow-up. So from your research, mm -hmm. what is the extent, in your opinion, of the involvement of civil society? I mean, you mentioned a problem of transparency in public-private yeah. partnerships and cybercrime, which for me seems a very natural field and or a gap that the civil society organizations could yeah. provide. Uh, is this happening? We all know that law enforcement cooperation is probably one of the most secretive exactly. areas. So, so exactly. what is, what is what's your take it on that? It has been, I mean, most of the use cases I found in the course of my research are, uh, of course, uh, drawing attention to cooperation uh, under the framework of PPPs between law enforcement and uh, uh, obviously the states, the governments. However, for instance, I can uh, show, well, I can talk shortly about uh, one case, uh, which is, I don't know if you have heard about Sweetie uh, 2.0, is a application, it's a chatbot that was created in, uh, by Terre de Homs, which is an NGO, basically, so representing civil society. Um, to, together with um, a, a, an X or Y company, I, can, I cannot recall the name, and um, it has been deployed already, and it has been already uh, being, um, yeah, causing some, uh, at the same time of, of, of bringing some attention on the effectiveness of this, uh, uh, this chatbot that was deployed to help Terra de Oms, in this case the NGO, um, uh, to tackle and trace, uh, um, it was on uh, online sexual exploitation of children and uh, sexual tourism. Um, um, one of the outcomes of this, of this deployment of this technology based on the PPPs uh, has been that uh, there has been an enactment of a specific law in Philippines where mostly uh, the, most of the cases were traced. Um, so once again, we go back to the regulatory framework there is some, that is so far the only case I know at the moment based on PPPs to counter cybercrime where civil society, Terra de Oms in this case, has uh, deployed uh, based on this uh, framework of PPPs uh, technology to prevent in this case but also to find evidence against cyber criminals. So I could, um, I could mention there is a, very, a lengthy report of uh, University of Leiden of, of course, the drawbacks and also the, uh, the uh, important uh, impact of this uh, partnership. But I, I think it's uh, from the um, general uh, point of view, I think it's a step forward. And I see this positive in the sense that uh, can uh, uh, give some light on future uh, interventions of or participation of civil society uh, in, the, in the framework of PPPs. Thank you very much. We'll change a bit uh, the direction, um, literally, but also in the terms of, uh, of the work that's being done. Enrico, you are based in South Africa. We always have the conversation and exchanges, how do we bring more organizations from the global south into this conversation? And uh, recently, so you've started some research work uh, in that direction. I was wondering if you could give us a bit more exactly, some more idea on how this ecosystem looks in the global south, how, what are the main challenges, uh, how well or how badly is the whole system working there and how could, what we actually can do as part of the uh, conversation. Okay, thank you, Patrick, for this uh, yeah, somehow very difficult question. But we, we started to collect some evidence on, uh, on different models of uh, uh, public-private partnerships, uh, public-private interplays, and multi-stakeholder collaboration in, uh, in internet policy making, specifically on, uh, on cybersecurity. And um, we, so we have observed that uh, the, 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 the literature, the academic literature on this issue uh, comes from the uh, telecommunication sector, sector regulation, where historically um, the, the private sector was brought in in order to uh, somehow support uh, governments uh, where there is <coughs> a budget deficit, deficit or uh, shortage of, of, of skills. Therefore, forms of uh, uh, public-private partnerships that are more prescriptive uh, were somehow uh, established, especially for broadband rollout. Uh, but at the same time, um, 
as also uh, the internet and broadband infrastructure has evolved, uh, there is, has been observed a need for uh, making this kind of partnerships uh, less uh, prescriptive, but rather more uh, descriptive. And therefore, to, uh, to increase and, uh, the, the relationship between public and private sector, and we've observed an evolution towards interplay. So it's not anymore uh, a formalized uh, uh, and well-structured partnership, but more an interplay between uh, public and private sector. And then, of course, with the internet and the need of uh, cross-border or international cooperation, um, the inclusion of different actors and partners within this collaboration has emerged very strong. And therefore, we have seen uh, the evolution of this sort of interplay into multi-stakeholder collaboration that they can really take different forms. Um, we have analyzed, uh, for instance, the case of Mauritius, uh, because uh, uh, Mauritius uh, is uh, ranked as top African country in the ITU uh, Global Cybersecurity Index of 2017. Uh, the island wants to become a regional hub for ICT uh, in the SADC and Kumesa uh, region. Uh, AFRINIC, the Internet Registry for Africa, is based also in uh, uh, Mauritius. And the country's got a well-developed uh, national cybersecurity strategy for 2014 and 2019. And uh, they've got a specific goal, number three, uh, which is uh, they want to develop an efficient collaborative model between the authorities and the business communities uh, for uh, cybersecurity. And uh, in the implementation of the strategy, uh, we have observed an evolution uh, of two different uh, models. The first one, first phase, as we called it, uh, had basically a number of uh, predefined roles and uh, hierarchical de de dependency between the different actors uh, uh, involved. So it was very prescriptive, it lacked of uh, flexibility, and it was some sort of closed structure, so similar to a PPP uh, model. In the phase two, instead, um, the model evolved um, towards more interaction uh, rather than uh, hierarchical reporting lines between these different uh, actors. The model was more descriptive, and uh, there was a robust information sharing um, between the, uh, the different actors. It was actually one of the main success of, um, of that collaboration, and the model was more open. Uh, that said, um, the model did not really uh, include uh, civil society organizations in uh, the scope that they should be basically uh, involved, because they are uh, they, they are the more vulnerable, probably, actors together with, uh, with the users in a, in a cybersecurity um, cyber space. And, um, and so they should somehow play an important role uh, beyond uh, the, uh, the formal uh, democratic structure of participation, you know, in uh, public hearings and this kind of activity. So while we can still see um, an important role of the private sector, and we perfectly understand uh, why it's there. Uh, you know, it owns the critical information infrastructure, uh, it's got strong commercial interest, uh, and uh, detains most of the information available. We still couldn't really see a very strong participation at the same level of the civil society um, in the country. Thank you for this. Um, we'll have uh, actually two, I want to say government representatives, but also regional organizations. I think both of you were involved on the government side, now one working for the government, another one for a regional organization. Uh, how, do you, how do you, Robert and Karian, see the involvement of uh, civil society in those efforts? I mean, Karian OAS has been implementing projects in uh, Latin America for years now with uh, pretty big success. I wonder to what extent your cooperation with uh, civil society actors was um, successful or not, or what part of that debate was it? Uh, in your case, Robert, the CTO has been quite active in the Commonwealth uh, countries as well. Would that play any role? What's the, what's the approach of uh, FCO when you talk about uh, cyber capacity building? Karen, we'll start with you and um, give us some uh, governmental slash into regional organization perspective. I think I'll probably start off at the organization-wide level. Um, I'm within the cybersecurity program of the OAS. 
or just the OAS generally as a regional model has always ensured that civil society can come to the table and be part of our decision-making process. Even though we're an inter-regional political body, civil society has the option to go onto the OAS website and register as a civil society. And once that is done, it's now a recognized body that can participate in any or sit in and listen to any one of our political meetings that are happening. And I think just that stance alone actually shows that a regional body that is made up of government recognizes the role that civil society can play in decision making. Um, from the cyber security program perspective, um, we have partnered with civil society in, I think, so many activities and encouraged our member states to have government partner with civil society as well. Um, for development of national cyber security strategies, for example, for Mexico, Paraguay, Guatemala, they ensured that the process was transparent enough that civil society could have submitted comments. Um, for Costa Rica, during the review process, ISOC had led the actual discussion, took notes, submitted the notes, and pardoned with the government to go through what was collated. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out as well, though, that the civil societies that we work with, we, we're at the point where I think we're thinking, how can we engage them more? because the competencies can be increased. Persons think of civil society, and I think many times they just think of them in the form of awareness raising. And I think for the OAS cyber security program, we are trying to see how we can go beyond that. There's a need for competencies to be built because civil societies are so active and engaged in freedom of speech, digital rights, and it's not just advocating, but actually developing tools and developing mechanisms that society can get involved in a discussion. Um, another element I wanted to look at is that um, civil society cooperation actually leads to trust. Um, if it is that they are involved in the political process and the discussion, when the document does go out, there's a level of trust from society to believe that, hey, someone else looked at this. It wasn't just a government's decision. It was actually a part of a process and dialogue that involved it. Um, I think the last thing I wanted to raise is we also have a model where we are trying to merge civil society and private sector with our convening power. A good example of that is we have an ongoing project with Trend Micro that's called Cyber Women Challenge. And for example, when we had to implement it in Colombia, it was actually a civil society that girls who code pretty much that actually was our partner on the ground. And they were able to get women at the table learning technical skills. And it was the private sector being our partner through that. So just to widen the discussion is that you have PPC, see, which I like, because it's really a public-private partnership that can actually have civil society, not just as the target of the training, but actually an equal playing partner in getting the process done and completed properly. So I think, yeah. Great, Th thanks for making this point about the convening power, because I think that this link between private sector and civil society is not always that explicit. We have initiatives that, uh, have been undertaken worked uh, quite well and say with civil societies kind of becoming a target of the initiatives rather than a real partner and I think uh, that's an interesting point. Uh, Robert, you represent the government that I think is one of the few that have realized the power of civil society in research because you've invested financially but also uh, a lot of uh, your own energy uh, in the uh, Global Oxford Cyber Capacity Building Center and I think it's still one of the few initiatives where we see this kind of uh, the engagement between the government and the research institute bringing very concrete results. But if you can expand a bit the, this uh, conversation and share some of your own experiences having been engaged both in the GFC but also many other venues, uh, that would be great. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you. Uh, it's always nice to be the government person on a panel. <laughs> um, so my name is Robert Collett. I work for the Foreign and Commonwealth Office within the UK government and I run our projects helping other countries improve their cybersecurity capacity and trying to learn from them to improve the UK's cybersecurity capacity. Um, and we do that because we live in an interconnected world um, and the UK cannot be safe and keep its citizens safe on its own. Obvious things that you know about. Um, we've been doing that since 2012 uh, and in response to an international call for action um, coming out of UN supported bodies um, for countries to help each other. Um, and when we think about helping countries, we don't just mean 
working with the government and helping the government, but we mean working with the government, their citizens, civil society organizations, universities, and companies. Um, and since we started, we've invested about 10 million into projects, working with over 100 countries or so, I'd say. Um, and I think the, if I can give any message to take away from what it looks like from a government side and doing this is that um, we're surprisingly dependent upon civil society. Um, most of the people we need to protect are outside of government. Most of the critical assets we need to protect are not uh, run by governments. Um, most of the people doing the research in this sector uh, are outside of governments. Um, when we want to go and send experts to another country, there aren't many experts inside of governments. We don't employ that many cybersecurity people, and most of them are really busy defending the UK day to day. So when we need to send experts to another country, we look outside of government and largely to civil society. Um, so that's why from inside government looking out, it feels like we're really dependent on civil society and actually that's a good and healthy thing. Um, and it's really great when we develop these partnerships with universities or think tanks, um, local civil society organizations, groups of experts giving their spare time, like FIRST, the community of incident responders. Um, that they do really good work. Um, one, because they know about their subject and they do it because they really care about it. They have a passion for these things. Um, and so in all of our projects, even when it's government working with government, it's often civil society in the middle of that relationship, coming up with the research, coming up with how we do our jobs. Literally, Patrick wrote the playbook and guide for how people in government should do their jobs in capacity building. Um, and then it'll often be uh, civil society, university, non-government people who are having those conversations on the ground, paid for, funded by the UK government, but talking to, say, the government of Colombia, who was on the last panel. That was a team from Oxford, um, and also some UK civil servants, but largely Oxford people, going out having those conversations. So um, from inside government, it looks like a very strong and healthy relationship, um, but I know that we should be doing more and that's why I come to places like the IGF because I want to meet more of the civil society people out there who have the best ideas um, and the best solutions that we should be working with. Thanks Robert for stressing this idea of the dependency. Uh, I, I think an important point to make here as well is that people like yourself and Carrie Ann do not have an easy job within your own organizations because I know that whenever you have anyone within the government waving the flag of civil society, you're automatically put in the corner of the civil society guys, even within your own government, which sometimes uh, makes things difficult. Um, I would like to explore a bit, a bit this idea of the dependency, and uh, we have Lucy and Daniela uh, on the panel. Uh, both of their organizations have been very much involved, indeed, in kind of doing a, a real capacity building work uh, in cyber, so uh, if you both could Give us a bit uh, of an idea of uh, the, the concrete projects that you will be doing, that you have been doing. But I would also like to talk a bit around this, uh, you know, idea of dependency because uh, I think very often uh, what what's happening is we have this lip service being paid to the civil society participation, uh, and I, I would like to get your uh, your perception of that. To what extent it's still there, and how can we actually shake it up a bit and to make sure that we have this. Uh, much fuller engagement. So, Daniela, let's start with you and then Lucy. Great. Uh, thanks, Patrick. And I'm going to keep my intervention very brief so that we can have time to discuss. Um, I want to focus actually on two aspects that I think I, are quite key to understand these partnerships as partnerships of equals. Um, first, I think, is the fact that civil society is so broad and so diverse and we need to get beyond the stakeholder silos that we continue to talk about sometimes and understand that civil society actors can be policy experts, activists, academics, researchers, technologists, um, and there's such a broad range of expertise, so reducing civil society to one label will make us think that civil society has one role when that's not necessarily the case, um, and that you know, it can create artificial barriers, but also, most of all, it's a missed opportunity to really 
delve, you know, and, and tap on that, on that expertise. And um, the second aspect um, that I wanted to raise was that it's a takeaway from our organization's work, um, and in particularly, uh, particularly in engaging um, stakeholders in cybersecurity processes and, and capacity building, and it's that we can't do stakeholder engagement in a piecemeal way. It needs to be done in a holistic and sustained way. And civil society need to be brought on board as partners from the get-go. They need to help craft the projects themselves. They need to uh, provide critical input that will help you tailor the projects so um, that they're, they're more tailored to and suited to the needs, but then also it will, as Carrie Ann was saying, it will help increase trust and create buy-in that we see as critical for then the successful implementation of the, of the projects. Um, and this is also quite linked to, I think, how we think capacity building in general and do not think it in a vertical way and, you know, not as substituting capacity, but rather doing it in a, in a more collaborative way and in, in a more fluid way. And like Enrico was saying, moving from a hierarchical model um, to something that's more a collaborative um, approach. Um, in terms of some examples that come to mind, so we've been actually collaborating with the OES for a couple of years now, and in, per in particular with their symposium. So it's an annual cybersecurity symposium, and they gather um, stakeholders, and I think it's the second year in a row that our civil society partners have been delivering a cybersecurity and human rights track there. And I think that's also interesting because um, it's, you know, capacity building where th they build their capacity by being there and preparing for, um, for that, but then also building the capacity of the other actors and stakeholders um, that, are, that are there. So I think the roles and the lines are um, quite blurred and, and fluid sometimes. Thanks a lot. And let me, I've already talked about OAS and, uh, and FCO, but I think we also, I see also we have our uh, Swiss colleagues in the room, Chandresa and Leon, and I would like to credit them for uh, organizing something that I think really um, shows the value of the involvement between public, private, and civil society, the Geneva Dialogue that you have had on norms that actually try to discuss how different groups of actors actually play a role in shaping the normative uh, aspect and actually that was one of the meetings where probably I think most of the participants were from civil society rather than from governments in the private sector so uh, kudos to you and thank you for, for organizing that. Uh, Lucy, your turn. Thank you. Oh, it is a kind of scary echo with the mic here. Okay. So hi, I'm Lucy. I work for an organization called Access Now. Um, the other day I was here and I was introduced as one of the few organizations who actually do cybersecurity capacity building on the ground. And I enjoyed that intro because mainly I've never thought of us that way, um, but I enjoyed that branding. I think we kind of stumbled into that role by coincidence. Uh, we have always been a very grassroots run organization. Our key focus has been on something we call the Access Now Helpline which is a digital security desk that's open 24 hours, seven days a week for, and available really for anyone um, who needs help with their cybersecurity. Um, and we build our work on top of that. Any policy, any um, communications and advocacy we do stems from the lessons we learn um, in that environment. And I think the important thing that I struggle with in this world of cybersecurity multi-stakeholder discussions is that there are differing definitions of cybersecurity. And I think the other day there was a joke made on one of the panels that there are two types of states in the world. Uh, those who view cybersecurity as something to be protected, um, something about the user, um, which is where very much we are. For us, it's very much about the individual. It starts very much with the individual and that's where the conversations should begin, not about international norms and then working our way down. And there are states who view cybersecurity as a space to control and manipulate the population and kind of have a secure environment. And so that's where a lot of our struggles in these international conversations also come from because we're initially, we're balancing basically two sets of expectations and narratives um, in these spaces. So um, as, as a part of the helpline, one of the things we also offer is a digital security clinic. Um, one of that's also available um, in the beautiful booths here at IGF. 
Um, we also offer training to other NGOs. So how to respond, um, what happens when people come to you with really complex issues. And a part of it is technical. A big part of it is really helping people understand technologies and how they can make it work for them. A big part of that is also legal and providing that support. And I think that's a little bit where the role of civil society, and I, and you're right, Patrick, there's a lot of lip service, but I don't see the interaction to the degree that it could exist. Um, there's a really big need for some of the governmental programs that do exist to communicate with civil society that's doing the work on the ground like us and other organizations are doing. So there are funds, for instance, emergency funds for um, human rights defenders who run into trouble um, and they're not getting distributed effectively because really the human rights defenders that we're already aware of in Europe, if you're aware of someone who's working in Pakistan or if you're aware of someone in India, those people have already reached superstar level. So they're gonna get the support they want. But how, to make, how do we make those programs and how do we make that money trickle down? That's the real issue. And that I think is a challenge in private public partnerships in general. I really hate using the term PPP because I studied economics. <laughs> and for me, it's purchasing par parity. So, <laughs> so whenever I see PPP on the screen, I'm like, what are we talking about? Anyway. Um, I think the issue there is because it's so high level, it really becomes about the government and the company. And the companies only answer to shareholders, and the governments only answer in the end to the political parties who currently govern them. So the narrative for civil society tends to get very lost in those conversations. The more things that are outsourced from the government to companies, um, the worse it is for civil society because companies are protected by a, a lot of anti-transparency laws and legislations. I can FOIA a government program, I can't FOIA a, a contract they have necessarily with a private company. So in these relationships, a lot of things actually get lost for us. And we're brought in at a certain time. I smile when I hear that we can submit comments. I love it. It's half my job is submitting comments to consultations. Um, but I think there really needs to be a meaningful interaction and we really need to start thinking about the really the individual unique people that these things are meant to serve because if you get too stuck thinking about the processes, the organizations, um, I think the cybersecurity on the ground and the people who really need the support suffer. Thanks Lucy. Um, I think we have about 15 minutes for uh, conversation, questions, answers, comments. I would like to get the show of hands in the room. Uh, who of you has a question, a comment, uh, observation you'd like to share? Okay, I have two people. So uh, the lady at the back and then uh, Vlada here in the front. So hi, my name is Catherine Tai. Um, so I love this discussion about multi-stakeholder uh, uh, approach because my organization is also doing a lot of a public-private partnership, public-private dialogue type of work, and we also engage a lot with civil society. So my question today is uh, about uh, civil society. How do we engage civil society in um, authoritarian countries? Uh, uh, some, as uh, some of the panelists said, that um, you know, civil society is uh, basically a label, right? So it could mean academics, think, think tanks, and different things. But in some authoritarian countries all these institutions are state-sponsored or state-funded. So then how do you have a meaningful dialogue or engagement with, um, you know, a countries, in countries that civil societies or genuine civil society basically is non-existent? Thank you for that question. Vlada, do you want to? I'll collect them. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, Vladimir Radunovic, Diplo Foundation. I'm actually uh, writing a report or catching the notes for the Digital Watch, so I'm jumping in my own notes, but I'll, I'll be quick. I wanted to share two more, ex two more examples of, uh, of uh, a role of the civil society in, in uh, um, this PPP, uh, or public-private partnership, if you prefer more. Um, one is the, the personal experience from, from Diplo Foundation, where we, for years, have been actually been the one, and we are the NGO, even though educational, and I think, as Daniela said, uh, we shouldn't see civil society as one chunk. There is diversity of civil society organizations. So we have been the ones to actually helping the governments understand the uh, cybersecurity policy and the environment. So that's a particularly interesting role of uh, civil society helping the governments in educating. Uh, and a particular example of that is from Serbia, where I come from, where we as an NGO managed to be the one to get all the governmental representatives around the table, plus telecoms and others, because um, they trust us, 
uh, we are an NGO, uh, and also because we don't have bureaucratic limitations. For them to get together, it's a big deal. It's a lot of administration. For us, it was quite easy, with a bit of support of the OSC, to get them together and um, throughout five years create a fantastic informal multi-stakeholder group, which now helps drafting the strategy, law, uh, and, and all these things. So that's a, an interesting example that we are trying to see whether it can fit somewhere else as well. And the other one is actually comes from the research that we did is how different states develop their own cyber competencies. That's something that Robert mentioned. And uh, the examples of the o couple of OECD countries that we ran to, uh, Finland, Estonia, uh, Israel, UK, uh, Netherlands, uh, Germany, Korea, shows that in, in developing national competencies, it is a huge uh, set of examples of the public-private partnership where governments mainly give the incentives, a bit of funding, but mainly the um, incentives with helping with um, uh, legislation and stuff, uh, policy issues uh, to set up the initiatives. Private sector jumps in with a lot of uh, funding and, and um, cutting edge skills. And then academia is actually the one that uh, expands their, their uh, curricula uh, with this knowledge that set up together with the private sector uh, innovation hubs, uh, joint ventures, develop business and so on. Israel is a good example, uh, UK have some, um, Netherlands have some, so that's, that's quite an interesting uh, example as well. Thank you. Thanks, thank you both. And I think uh, Diplo Foundation has also worked with the GFC on uh, global good practices, which then fed into the, into the whole reflection process. There's a question in the front. Thank you very much. Russian Federation, if you don't mind, just not a question, just slight, slight remarks, slight, slight, slight comments. Uh, I would like to share our own experience, and because I do represent the, uh, the government organization, the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I would like to support the idea uh, just mentioned by the distinguished colleague of, of UK, saying that the uh, private-public partnership is the essential part of the normal work, uh, on curbing and fighting uh, uh, cybercrime, uh, a cyber terrorism issue, or cyber security in principle. There was many uh, interesting, uh, <laughs> remarkable, remarkable uh, uh, remarks there, as I can say. And as far as I understand, there is a new generation of, of researchers uh, uh, trying to, to find any solution in fighting cybercrime. Uh, but you have to understand that in spite of the uh, very, very strong interconnections between civil society, the government organizations, and the business society, by the way, the business society is more, is more probably well prepared to some, uh, 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 well, uh, malicious activity because of the, of the well, well good equipment that to some extent. Uh, but it is, it is impossible to do without the only one platform on which we can fight. There is some mentioning regarding the Budapest Convention, for example, but you see uh, uh, there is no, no well, uh, unique approach in the world toward these quite, quite uh, pending issues. So in this case, I would like to invite you, please, to uh, conduct your work to be done under the only UN umbrella. The only United Nations could join, could combine all the efforts together. In this case, uh, I would like, just for your fresh information, yesterday, yesterday night on the third committee of the uh, 73rd General Assembly was adopted the uh, draft resolution proposed by the Russian Federation and the 32 co-sponsors. The name of the draft of that resolution is the Countering the Use of Information and Communications Technologies for Criminal Purposes. So it does mean that since next year, we will start the right political dialogue within the UN scope, and we would like to invite you, all the organizations, to participate closely to discuss all the pending and, well, topical issues that could be raised during uh, uh, this year or the next one. But please, don't confine yourself on the only one legal instrument like Budapest Convention. There are seven in the world, seven different regional instruments. And each region deserves uh, uh, any, any legal foundation to be discussed. But the only UN umbrella can join us. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask you a quick follow-up question on that, uh, following your invitation for the civil society to join the conversation? What will be the mechanisms through which the civil society will be able to participate in the discussion, given that UN is primarily the government-driven uh, organization? Well. According to the UN procedure, the mechanism is quite simple. 
there is the number of uh, uh, well non-government non organizations that should be just be associated with the uh, UN Secretary to be registered there and to be invited. There is a normal procedure. It's surely not wrong. And uh, in, in each UN session, just multiple business and civil society are invited in different in different topics. For example, the human rights protection or something like that. Probably, if you just, uh, uh, well, investigate this issue more thoroughly within the UN Secretary, and there is surely not, not, not quite difficult for, for any uh, NGO organization to participate. Thank you. Thank you for that. And there's uh, one question over, okay, well, I have two more. Can I see the show of hands, as I have two here? Okay, this will be the last two I take, and then we'll go back to the panel. So Hi. I'm Deepak Maheshwari. I work with Symantec in India, as a cybersecurity company globally. Uh, so in India, our experience on capacity building has been like this. So about three years back, we partnered with the IT Industry Association, NASCOM, developed course curriculum on cybersecurity, which were developed ground up, looking at the requirements. So there were several other companies and banks and others also involved, other vendors also. And then once those courses were ready, they got approved by the government's National Skill Development Corporation for certification. And in addition to that, with the civil society, with a particular civil society organization, we actually instituted scholarship for 1,000 women that get certified as a cybersecurity professionals. And I'm happy to share that in our first batch, out of 62 who have certified, 27 were women. And uh, hopefully, this uh, uh, in a few year, months' time or years' time, uh, it will be almost equal. Thank you. Thank you very much. And here. Hi, um, Louise Marie Urell, um, Europe Institute. Uh, I'd just like to make a quick comment, at least uh, to reposition a little bit um, the discussion on the Global South and the experiences in the Global South. And I thank a lot Enrico also for, for bringing up um, the experiences. Um, and, uh, and also, I think it's about bringing this, uh, something that Lucy was uh, mentioning, which is where do we meet? You know, this bottom-up process and this top-down process, if we can go through this generalization, but uh, over at Igarape, we have been doing research on cybersecurity governance in Brazil and trying to actually map the actors and do capacity building, trust building, because at the end of the day, it's a very slow process sometimes. And I do think we have to, I, I've seen throughout the interventions, and I think there is at least two considerations. The first one would be to be very careful in understanding multi-stakeholder processes, understanding public-private partnerships, and understanding subject matter expertise, which I think sometimes can be very confused, uh, especially when you're talking about processes uh, and building initiatives and building new channels and new um, cybersecurity um, processes. But what we, and the second point that I was going to mention is with regards to the experience in Brazil. So what we did, we organized a series of convening sessions trying to actually put everyone on the table. And what we get at is that there is a huge challenge of building language, common language between stakeholder groups. And this time more on the multi-stakeholder one, but I think it would be interesting just to bring a little bit more uh, of another experience from another country. And what we found out was that actually there is a huge confusion of what are the responsibilities and competencies versus the sectors. So we get people together, but they're talking about the same cybersecurity, but absolutely different conceptions of it. So how do you build policy on that? How do you actually um, get them to map out together what are the priority areas? So this is one of the challenges, and I think it's in the very early stages since policy in Brazil is very concentrated on the public administration. Uh, but just wanted to bring this experience and also bring the nuances of using interchangeably the terms of multi-stakeholder uh, public-private partnerships and the subject matter expertise that hasn't come up, but obviously in these processes you see a lot of that. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, so I'll take it back to the panel. I'll give you about uh, two, three minutes each for uh, quick reactions. Uh, I'll let you pick what you want to answer, but there are a few questions that I think we uh, should not miss from that conversation one how do we work with the countries where civil society is uh, government affiliated kind of how do you how do you react there there was a comment on uh, the Budapest convention and one of the seven uh, regional bodies and supposedly this being one of the regional ones I think we may have a uh, different uh, comments on that uh, so let's start with Rob and we'll take it in this direction 
Okay. Um, yeah, there were uh, lots of interventions there, so um, I'll try to not cover all of them. Um, I would have loved to have had a conversation with my Russian colleague, but he's left. So um, these are sort of uh, directed to, to him, but uh, it should be a discussion here. Um, I say yes, there are different regional conventions out there. We're a signatory to the Budapest Convention. All I can say is, one, we find it really useful for doing practical cooperation between uh, law enforcement agencies. So it works for what we need to do as a country and the other countries that, who are signatories tell us that it works for them as well. Um, and there's no reason if you're, say, an African country why you can't sign up both to the African Convention and the Budapest Convention. Um, these two things are not mutually exclusive and some um, have signed up to both. So uh, that would be my response on that. In terms of the um, question uh, which it's sort of alluded to about the role of the UN and how much this is a multilateral versus a multi-stakeholder conversation, um, Obviously, we are really um, strong proponents of multi-stakeholderism in cybersecurity, having a multi-stakeholder conversation. Um, governments need to be in the room to have that conversation, um, and it's definitely uh, one that we are up for, and we really welcome civil society being part of that. And we also think that um, there is uh, law governing cyberspace, those laws which govern um, offline equally apply on online um, and we'd rather get about practical solutions in cooperation with civil society right now than have a long multilateral discussion um, the outcome of which might not be very helpful for anybody so I'd say look to practical solutions which work today and look to them in cooperation with civil society um, and I absolutely take Louise's point on language um, even just within, this is sort of not quite your point, but even just within the cybersecurity technical community, we have long discussions about what is a breach and what is not a breach, and different departments measuring them in different ways. If you then bring in others outside government to that conversation, then it gets even more complicated, um, but that doesn't mean that we don't need the conversation, and ideally when doing capacity building, which is what we do, that should be a multi-stakeholder conversation within each country. It, it should be uh, technical experts, civil society groups of various kinds and government talking about how they see the issues of terminology uh, and interpretation. Um, and finally, yes, it's really hard if there aren't authentic civil society groups to work with um, in a country. I think that should give pause as to what kind of projects you run in that country. Um, and it also shows that cybersecurity capacity building, um, and I keep coming back to that because that's what I work on, can't be done in isolation. It needs to be seen within the context, sorry, of wider digital programs and then wider governance programs and human rights projects. And um, it is within a whole ecosystem of other activity which needs to be mutually supportive. Uh, just a very brief comment maybe on the engagement of civil society in authoritarian countries. That is um, actually a very controversial and complicated uh, issue. Uh, but based on, on my experience in, um, not in authoritarian, but in uh, maybe more difficult countries, for instance in Africa where we have seen that governments uh, started to shut down the internet during the elections, or applying uh, retrogress retrogressive taxes, for instance, to social media use. Um, a good way of interacting with governments is actually to provide them uh, evidence and research uh, that actually shows that maybe sometimes their policy and decisions actually are uh, counterproductive for the, for the population. Um, an example, for instance, is in, um, in Uganda. Um, now some research has been done on the negative effect of the tax on, uh, on social media use and demonstrating that actually if that tax is removed, uh, the GDP of the country will, will increase. So uh, if actually the civil society is able to establish this kind of, um, of interaction based on evidence uh, with the government, it might be an easier uh, way uh, also for the civil society to interact in countries that might be considered uh, authoritarian and not taking into account the civil society voice. 
Um, thanks. Yeah, I, I agree um, with Enrico. I think that's a tricky question because I think pr the f one of the prerequisites for multi-stakeholder approaches to um, to succeed is a genuine commitment from government. So sometimes if that's not there, you know, it's not sufficient having that, but it is crucial and that buy-in and commitment is key. I think um, on top of, of Enrico's comment, I think also explore engagement with other stakeholder groups. So civil society and private sector many times will have commonalities um, in, their, in, their, in their interests. Um, so I think, yeah, exploring that might also be an option. Thanks. Uh, the gentleman who asked the question is no longer in the room, but uh, for the sake of the conversation, Catherine, do you want to uh, pick up the Budapest Convention? Well, I will just uh, uh, and hope that he returns to the room to hear Robert's points, which I absolutely endorse. I think Robert's made may a very good uh, case for um, the uh, Budapest Convention, and indeed, uh, from the academia and the legal research uh, point of view, I absolutely think this is a clear and transparent and therefore to some extent uh, uh, able to create trust for uh, public-private partnerships uh, to counter cyber crimes. So um, just as a point of clarification um, on how big is the impact of the, of the um, uh, Budapest Convention, it is it's a framework for procedural law. So it has provided such a framework to understand what are the interactions between, in this case, one of the stakeholders, government stakeholders, which is the law enforcement, and uh, obviously the, uh, the prosecutor, uh, judges, and uh, the jurisdictional parties. So, um, and also, obviously, based on the, f provided that this implementation of the uh, uh, powers, investigatory powers or, uh, that are given through this uh, public-private partnership framework, is uh, well implemented in the national level. So that's also independence of uh, the implementation uh, of uh, such a procedural power. So it's not given and it's not as straightforward as it can uh, seem by, by some uh, uh, stakeholders. However, it is a, a framework that exists, that is there and is being used so far. There is. Uh, uh, plenty of reports on, uh, especially on the Eastern region, and how this framework has been used by the Council of Europe with concrete conclusions. So definitely, I repeat, it's a starting point for any academic research um, uh, on uh, PPPs uh, to counter cyber crimes. Um, okay, there's too many questions to answer, I think, uh, holistically in the time we have. So if you want to come up to me after and have some of those conversations, I'd be happy to. What I want to highlight, other than I like the term authentic civil society, it makes me feel like a fancy Italian meal. Um, <laughs> what I want to highlight is that there's a real disconnect between the understanding of personal security in cybersecurity and societal security in cybersecurity. And it's a real shame for me as a researcher who did risk-based theories to see the real focus on minimizing the, secure, the societal risks. Because everywhere else when we legislate, we accept a certain level of risk. Somehow we have reached the point in Europe and globally where the risk of anything in digital needs to be zero. And you're not gonna solve that by controlling technologies. You're not gonna solve that by micromanaging how those technologies are implemented. Societal issues need to be solved outside of the digital realm. And the way this focus has been going, it continuously, it consistently undermines the efforts of organizations like ours who work with users on the ground to improve their security and to improve their personal risk models. So that's what I want to leave you with. Try and focus on the users. So thank you everyone for all your comments. Uh, I think the GFC, it's a bottom-up platform which really uh, encourages uh, private, public-private civil partnerships in cyber capacity building. Uh, I think the move that we're making right now towards implementation creates more room for more stakeholders at the table. And I'm looking forward to continue the discussion with you and also through the advice board to see which stakeholders can join the GFCE to create a better and more uh, multi-stakeholder platform. Thank you. I think from where I sit, just um, 
looking at all the questions that were asked, I think it's important to recognize what we started off the conversation on, that it's bringing everyone into the room. It's not civil society outside being consulted, but recognizing that as multi-stakeholderism, we need to ensure that everyone is coming because they have something to contribute. And I think those civil society entities, NGOs, as we've already pointed out, the structure has, it's not what we traditionally think it as. It's not just Greenpeace. It's more recognizing that there are competencies everywhere and we have to capitalize on that. And the reason I raised that, even the question about the Budapest Convention, some persons may not even realize what the issue was that was being raised here. And I think it's important that civil society bring knowledge to the users because the issue that was being raised there is much bigger than this discussion can even touch. And those of us in the room who know, and I think that's the bridge that needs to be built is to get that information out there. So thank you to my panelists. Thank you to all of you for your comments, questions, and for staying in the room for uh, slightly longer than initially foreseen. Uh, I would like to finish this panel by uh, reiterating our initial call for all of you who are interested in capacity building but, and who would like to contribute to this conversation in a bit more active way to reach out as well to us as members of the board, um, the advisory board of the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise. Uh, we have our representatives in each of the working groups uh, that were established under GFC dealing with the strategy standards, cyber crime, uh, and we're very much hoping to uh, get more of your inputs in the coming months and years. All, most of our communications will be also published on the website of the GFC, so, uh, so easy to follow. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you once again. I hope we will not have to meet next year to discuss a potential contribution or non-contribution of the civil society to the UN process in New York, um, but that would be an interesting uh, panel for sure. So uh, thank you all of you for participating and uh, enjoy your lunch and the rest of the conference. Thank you.